All right. How you guys doing? Want to welcome both the North Myrtle Beach campus, the Whiteville campus, and those online now around the world. Can you give all of our campuses a big hand clap? Man, we're glad you're here. And don't you love, you know what, our, our little cheer corner up here today. They're going to teach us a lot about what it means to walk with God. And so give them a big hand clap for helping us out today. You know, the amazing thing is uh, when Jesus taught when he was walking on earth uh, in, in his physical body, he oftentimes used uh, things to illustrate what it meant uh, to have life with our creator, what it meant to live life uh, spiritually. And, you know, he began to talk uh, in one place in the Bible about about what it meant to connect to our Creator, and he used children to teach, you know what, if you really want to connect with God, then you need to become like a little child. And so we're doing this series as we lead up to Christmas. We're talking off this one passage of Scripture a little bit for the next several weeks, and, and really we're learning how to stay forever young with our, with our faith. Because I do believe if we can stay young, we can stay connected, and we can live the life that God intends for us to live. How many of you like Christmas songs? Any Christmas song? Yeah, we like Christmas songs. We all have our favorites, right? Jingle bells. Is that somebody's favorite? Is that anybody's favorite, jingle bells? It is mine. So I like it. So, you know, it's interesting. Kids have, have amazing Christmas songs they love. Adults have Christmas songs they love. You know, there's some Christmas songs that adults like that kids don't like. And some Christmas songs don't make any sense whatsoever if you're really trying to, to, to help a kid become all they're created to be. But, but one of those songs that adults really like, and, and I know kids know it, and they kind of sing along because they, they want to participate, but adults love this, this one Christmas song, and I, I want us to sing it together today, and so I'll... I'll start us off, but I really need you to join in because I'm not that good of a singer. But I think you'll know it. And remember, us, those adults, they really like it. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not shout until you are. Santa Claus is coming To town. He you when you're he they're gonna sing the whole thing. They're gonna sing the whole thing. Now, you just took up two minutes of my teaching time today. <laughs> so we better get with it here. So. You ever thought about why adults like that song? And kids should hate it? <laughs> because it's like, hey, you're not going to get any Christmas presents unless you are good. And Santa Claus is not going to come see you. As a matter of fact, here in the South, we say he's going to give you a bag of switches, but you Northerners say he's going to give you a bag of... Oh. <laughs> and the reason we say that as kids is this. It, or, or we say that as adults is we want our kids to what? Behave. We think, man, if we can just bribe them a little bit. With, with these presents, and they'll be good for a couple of weeks. We, we can sing this song. And, and, and so kids sing along, but they still are devious, you know, and they got all this stuff going on behind, behind the scenes. Do y'all really like that song? Do you like that song? Huh? You don't, Shane? Why? So, Shane, what are you drawing up here? Huh? Oh, that's cool. He's drawing a face. <laughs> It's probably better than what some of those adults are doing on their phone right now. 
Just teasing. Just teasing. <laughs> but it, it, and a lot of times, that, that's how you feel when you come to church. You feel like you're going to get caught doing something bad or, you know, maybe somebody's going to notice something good. And the reason we feel this way a lot of times is because down through the ages, if, as people have been trying to teach who God is, they've taught humanity that, that, you know what, you better be good for God to love you, and if you're bad, He's not going to love you. And, and Jesus came on the scene. The Bible says he, He's born in a manger. He's born as a baby. He's born of a virgin birth. He comes on the scene, and He, and he grows up to be a human, but He's God in the flesh, and what He wants to do is he wants to reveal the heart of God to humanity. And, and really, he, he's, he's a gift to us all if, if we understand who He is and we unwrap the package. How many of you like seeing packages under the tree? Anybody? How many of you like shaking the packages under the, under the tree? Yeah, I bet these guys have already been shaking the packages under the under the tree. We, we do. I still do it today. Kim won't even put any packages under the tree because she knows I'm going to peek. <laughs> How many of you like opening the gift? Yeah. Most of us like opening the gift. And, and really in Jesus' day, there was a, a lot of people trying to figure out who he was. And there was a lot of speculations. They were, so to say, shaking the package. And they were saying he was this, he was that, and all other. And, and Jesus poses the question to his his closest followers, the Bible calls them his disciples, his students, and he says, well, who do you say I am? And really, at this point in the Bible, as Jesus is teaching, this point in his earthly ministry is where it moves to a different level and the gift begins to be unwrapped so humanity can know the heart of God. And so I want to read you the passage where, where Jesus dialogues with with, with his disciples as he's saying, you know, people are shaking the package trying to guess who I am. And this is what he says in Matthew 16, verse 13. The Bible says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? In other words, who, do people, who are people guessing I am? Well, they replied, some say that you're John the Baptist. That was one that came before Jesus. Some say you're, you're Elijah, you're kind of like Elijah. Some others are saying that, that maybe you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. In other words, you know what, you're, a, you're one that is talking about God. You're, you're one that is, is, is saying things and projecting who God is. You're, you're one, of, one of these people that is, is trying to reveal who God is, and, and you're talking about God. That's who people are saying you are. Now, there's a little bit of history I want to give you here because this really sets the whole message up. But the, the Jewish people in that particular day were looking for a king, a liberator. They called him a Messiah. And a lot of times in our culture today, we don't understand what they were looking for, a Messiah, but simply they had been taught for thousands and thousands of years God would liberate the Jewish people they would send a liberator, a king, um, you know, a, a great person to, to liberate them from the power of all the other political parties. And so they were looking for a Messiah, a king that would set them, set them free because God said that they were his special people. And so they're looking for the Messiah, and the Messiah is simply a liberator. And they had been looking for him, looking for him, looking for him, and the prophets had talked about him, talked about him, talked about him. And now the Messiah, Jesus, is on the scene, but no one is recognizing who he is. And so he asked that question, well, who do people say I am? And then he asked them, but who do you say I am? And then Simon Peter answered, one of the disciples, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human beings. In other words, all the people that are, are, are the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, religious leaders of the day, uh, Peter, they didn't teach you who I am. My Father revealed who I am. They were teaching you I would come, but no one, no one, Peter, is recognizing me. But you just did. 
you just did. And, and he says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Church simply means a people, a called out people. This is the first time church is mentioned in all of the Bible. And Jesus says, I'm going to build a people. I'm going to build a church that the gates of hell will not prevail. Or here in this passage, it says, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. On Christmas Eve, Eve, the 23rd and the 24th, we're going to talk a lot about these keys. I invite you to come because I believe God's going to really share some, some special things with you to encourage you in life. And, and so invite friends with you. We'll talk a little bit about these keys. We're going to be talking about this message for the, or, or this passage for the next couple of weeks. But understand right here is where everything begins to change. Because he says, Peter, you know what? What you just said about me is truth. What you just said about me is, and the faith that you just exhibited towards who I am is the kind of people that I'm going to build an amazing church out of and push darkness back. Now, I know church has formulas and has systems and, and has all kinds of religious ideas, but Jesus said, I'm going to build a people. I'm going to build a people that have incredible faith. And then he begins to teach them a little bit more about who he is. Because at this point in the game, they didn't understand that he was going to go to a cross. Nobody ever told them that the Messiah was going to go to a cross and die. No one ever told them that the Messiah was going to have to be put in a grave and resurrect three days later. Now, we all know that on the other side of the cross, if we've kind of got any history of, of the church and who God is. But at this point in time, he just says, hey, man, you're the liberator. It's awesome. It's awesome, and you're going to liberate the Jewish people, and I'm excited about it, and I'm willing to follow you, Jesus. And so from this point, Jesus had to begin to teach them what it meant and what he had to do and how they relate to him as, as the Messiah. So he starts talking a little bit about his crucifixion. He starts talking about his resurrection in the very next chapter, by the way. And he begins to reveal to them what he was going to have to do. But he also reveals to them who they are. And it's amazing because as he reveals to them who they are, in accordance to him, he begins to share story after story about being kids of a king. Remember, he's the king of the Jews, but he's also the king of humanity. And he begins to reveal to them what it means to live like a kid, a kid of, of God's kingdom. And they were excited about it. And I invite you to listen up today because I believe... God would say to us all that he wants us to have kid-like faith and trust him as, as the liberator, as the Messiah, and, and follow him as a leader, as a king. And the Bible oftentimes refers to him as a Lord. That's what a Lord is, is a, is a leader and a king. And he wants to teach us how to, how to really depend upon him and live life to the full. Jesus says, I come to help you live life to the full. But he uses a lot of illustrations with kids. And so today, I want to teach us as adults how to live positionally with our Creator in such a way that we can experience life how He intends for us to experience life. Because we all live in this world. We all have tribulation. We all have trouble. And remember, the enemy would love to intimidate you. He would love you to be full of fear. He would love for you to doubt everything. But he would like to say today to you, you know what? I want to reveal the heart of God. And he is not a God that says, you better not cry. You better not pout. You better not. Yeah. And, 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 but the people of Jesus' day have been beginning to make him that kind of God. And Jesus came into the world and he upset the apple cart, so to say, because he wanted to reveal the heart of God. Real quick, like in another place, Jesus says, hey, you can't, what he meant by this, he says, you can't put new wine in an old wine skin. And he was talking to these religious leaders who were trying to say that God is a, is a better not cry, better not shout, better not pout kind of God. He's saying, look, I come to reveal something to you. And you can't put me, you can't put me in a box, in a system, in a structure. I'll bust out of it every time because I am going to reveal who God is in this earth. 
And so he begins to reveal who we are. Let me, let me share it with you. First thing I wrote down in my journal is, is, is this. It's a, a lesson that he gets about, he gives about living like, like kids of a king. The first thing he reveals to us after he reveals who he is and what he came to do, he also reveals that he came to provide for us, not take from us. You may want to write that down. He came to provide for us, not take from us. Let, let me show it to you. Matthew 17, again, it's in this conversation. Matthew 17, verses 24 through 27. The Bible says, after Jesus and his disciples, they arrived in Capernaum. This is right after Jesus, uh, Peter announces him as the Messiah. The collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked a question. Remember, they were collecting a tax for people to come into the temple. Everybody that came into the temple, the Jewish temple in this day, had to pay a tax. Aren't you glad you don't have to pay for your seat to come to church today? Come on, somebody. And they ask him, does your teacher, referring to Jesus, doesn't your teacher pay temple tax? And Peter says, well, yes, he does. And when Peter came into the house, the very next conversation, the Bible says, Jesus was the first to speak. Remember, he's getting ready to reveal to the disciples who they are. He says, what do you think, Simon, he asked? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? He's using this situation and circumstance as an illustration. From others, Peter answered, then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, in other words, we don't want to upset the apple cart over there at the temple. We're not here to to cause a problem over there. He says, I need you to do something. Go to the lake and I need you to throw your line in. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll find four drachma. Two for me and two for you. Four drachma. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. I find this fascinating because Jesus had just revealed that he's the Messiah. Now he's revealing to Peter and the rest of the disciples of who they are in position to him as the Messiah and to the rest of the world. But he uses an illustration because they were saying, does your teacher pay the tax? Yes, yes, he pays the tax just like everybody else does. However, you know what? I, I'm going to pay the tax too, but, but he's going to provide He's going to provide the resources for me. It's like, it's like Jesus does this magic trick to get, to, get, to get Peter's attention. Go out there and get this fish. And by the way, when you get it, it's going to have the money for my temple tax in it, and it's going to have the money for yours too. And guess what? I'm your provider, Peter. Just never forget you're a kid of the king, and you don't need to worry about all this. I've got provision. I've got provision, even if it comes out of a fish's mouth, and I've got provision to take you to the, to the next level. See, kids, kids of a king that understand their king is being a good king also understand he provides everything they have in life. The enemy would love for each and every one of us to think that someone else provides it, that we typically provide it for our own self. And, 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 and we begin to, to get filled with, with, with selfish pride because we lose sight of the goodness of God and, and the king's hand in our life. Now, we work with the king. Notice Peter works with the king. He goes out and he catches the fish and he does what he needs to do. But it's, it's, it's the king providing it and taking care of his kid. Can I tell you something? Your great God will take care of every, every need you have in life. Jesus says this. He didn't say, I'll fill all your wants. But he did say this. I'll take care of every need you have. If I care for the sparrows that fly in the air, I care for you too. Yeah. 
Yes. I'll make provisions for you. Yes. And, and so what I thought I would do to illustrate this point, because uh, Jesus says, you know, uh, uh, children of the king, the king provides for them. So I want to illustrate this a little bit heavier today by, by providing some amazing snacks for these wonderful children and Brianna. Brianna's not a child. She is a child, but, but, but she's one of the, uh, the, the, our kids' directors over there. And Brianna, stand up. She's sitting here. I know she looks little, but, but she's really a big girl. You're a 20, 20, 20 year old kid. That's awesome, Brianna. Glad you're up here. But, but the rest of these are affiliated with us. So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give Brianna a snack first because she is a big kid. I'm going to provide a snack for y'all today. Okay. Bodie, you want your snack? Come on. Wow. <laughs> he was hungry. All right. Snack. Shane's. Oh. oh. <laughs> I don't know if I got enough now. Oh, shoot. It's all right. Everybody got, did you get one? No. Here. Here. Oh. <laughs> Ten second rule. That's awesome. Now, I provided them a snack. This is this is what, buddy, can I have one of your um, Skittles? <laughs> can, can I have a Skittle? Somebody give me a Skittle. Caden, can I have a Skittle? Oh, you're done. Ate all yours. <laughs> Somebody gave me a Skittle. That's awesome. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? Is a lot of times God provides for us, and God says, Hey, can I have a skittle? <laughs> and a lot of us, we do this, don't we? Well, God, thank you for the snack. It's awesome. We turn it up like Bodie, and then we wrinkle our cup up like this, and God's like, Well, dude, is that all the skittles you wanted? I mean, he's like, Done. And God's like, I want to give you more Skittles. But you don't wad it up, your piece of paper, your cup. How am I going to give you more Skittles? And he said, God said, hey, would you share a Skittle with me, the provider of the Skittles? And Moses like, oh, shoot, I done ate all the Skittles. <laughs> and really, I want you to understand today that God knows that, that we have needs. God knows we need provision in our life. And God's going to continue to give us provision in our life. But God just wants us to trust him as provider. And a lot of times when, you know, when we talk about money or whatever else in church, people are like, oh, shoot, I don't know if I want to give that church my money. Some of, some of my, I mean, you know how flipping hard I work for that money? Huh? You know? I mean, I understand. I do. I promise. But, but really, it's, it's not about you giving money to the church, though we use money to make ministry happen. But honestly, what God is trying to get all of our heart to understand is he's the great provider. And so a lot of times he'll say, hey, would you give me a Skittle? I, you know, that's what a tithe is, is a Skittle. It's one Skittle of the 10 that God gave you. And says, would you, would you give me a Skittle? But a lot of times we even ate all the Skittles wadded up our cup, and we're like, God, God, uh, uh, I'd love to give you a Skittle. And, you know, maybe that's where you are today. But what I want you to understand today is, is God's not trying to take a Skittle from you. God is really trying to help you understand his heart. Yeah. Yeah. And he is a provider. And what God wants to say, whether you wadded up your cup, would you recognize him as king, maybe starting today? And understand that he's not here to take from you. He's here to offer Skittles to everybody in the house. And he's here to provide. And 
And Bodie, though you've water, watered up your cup, I know you'd love to give me a Skittle. And, you know, you'd love to probably have some more. And, and so God wants to say, you know, you out, but... Can I have, Bodie, can I have a Skittle? Can I have a Skittle? Uh, uh. Woo! It's awesome. Look, what, what Jesus is teaching here is he's teaching, hey, man, you really want to live life to the full, Peter? You've recognized me as the liberator. But I came to not just liberate the Jews, by the way. I came to build a church. I came to, to liberate a people and help them live life and really push darkness back. But, but I need you to understand that I'm a liberator. I'm going to go to a cross. I'm going to go to a grave. I'm going to resurrect again. But I need you to understand in all of this, Peter, not just who I am, who you are. And I am a king that will provide for you. Provision, 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 provision. And, and childlike faith does that. It, it begins to really trust God. Not to get something, but it trusts God because of who He is. He's a great, uh, uh, he's a great provider. I'm not asking you to give any finances to this church to get something. If I ask you to give finances to this church, it is to help the mission of this church but it's also to help build your faith that God is a provider. And I just invite you into that. And the Bible says that God likes a cheerful giver. And a few weeks ago, you know, somebody said it doesn't always feel cheerful to give, but can give anyway. Well, I'd like to say to you, no, God would love for you to give cheerfully and have a cheerful heart in it and, and trust Him as provider. God is trying to get us to understand we need to become like children and trust Him as our heavenly, heavenly Father. Shane, where'd you get that shirt from? Huh? I don't know. Did you buy it? No. Well, who gave it to you? My mom. She provided the shirt for you, right? Mm-hmm. You think she'll ever buy you another one? Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm inviting you. I know sometimes we can grow up and we can get calloused and we can get hard, but God would invite you to humble yourself and come to the place of trusting him as the great provider. Number two, remember he's teaching them how to be kids again. Uh, and so the, listen, you kids are making too much noise up here. No, I'm just teasing. Go ahead and drop them if you want to drop them. I wish here. Hey, 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 put them in here. Don't drop the jar. Okay. Put them in, drop them. <laughs> I was going to give you the whole jar to hang on to. Come on, dog. All right. Don't drop the jar. That's your new can, okay? Maybe he'll share with some of y'all after the service today. That's really sometimes how we do, right? We don't make no noise. Be staunch, man. No, no, God wants you to come to him. He wants you to trust him. The next thing he wants to teach us today is, is this, is not only to trust him as provider, but also depend upon him like a kid. A, a, a kid-like dependency, because kingdom kids depend. And so, you know, he, he taught another place in the Bible. He taught how to, how to be a, a, a kingdom kid. And he goes on, in Matthew 18, he's still teaching who they are as, as kingdom kids. In verse 1, the Bible says this, about, about this time, the disciples, after all this other teaching, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It sounds like a bunch of kids. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I want to be great, don't you? Anybody else want to be great? Come on. I think God created you to want to be great. Now, the enemy may have suppressed that and pushed that down and lied to you. 
But God created greatness in each and every one of us. And, and they were thinking, okay, he's coming to set up a political, a political kingdom. He's coming to, to set up this, this kingdom. And, and Jesus is like, I want to help you understand how to be great. And so the Bible says this. Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Sydney, come here. You got your journal? Yeah. So it's like Jesus says, okay, I'm going to teach you how to be great, guys. Hey, you adult learners, you students, want to know how to be great in my kingdom? The Bible says he put a little child there. And this is what he says. He put a child among them, and then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins, what was their sins? Sins is missing the mark of God's glorious standard. Sin is not just the bad things we do in life that we tend to mark ourselves. Sin is just basically disbelief and distrust in God. And they had begun to trust in themselves. They had begun to trust in the systems of that particular day. They had begun to, to trust in the framework that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees had begin to teach. And Jesus says, unless you become like a little child and turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes humble as little Sydney here, as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who is, who welcomes a little child like this one on my behalf is, is welcoming, is welcoming me. You know, I tried to think about this a little bit yesterday and through the latter part of the week of how can I, how can I illustrate dependency with a little child? Because what Jesus was saying, listen, you'll be great in my kingdom, depend on me for everything. Like a little kid would depend upon their parents for everything. Like, like this, it's, a, it's amazing that Jesus brings a child out to illustrate to you and me how to become great. And, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, it says this, do not lean on your own understanding. In other words, don't lean on your own understanding. If, if you want to have a great life, don't lean. Trust God. Trust God with your heart, okay? Trust His ways. Depend upon Him. Don't depend on your own understanding. See His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. So I thought I would just take Sydney to illustrate what it means to depend upon God. Sydney, I don't need you to turn around. I want you to trust that I'm here. I want you to understand. I want you to straighten your legs out tight like a board. And what you to do is I want you not to lean on what you think, but lean on what I say. Now, Sydney, you and I have known each other for a little while now. And I hope that you can trust me. But what I need you to do is I don't need you to look back. I just need you to keep your legs straight. And don't lean on your own understanding. Just lean on what I say. I need you to lean back into my hand. Just lean back. Lean back. Keep leaning. Keep leaning. Keep depending. Keep trusting. How you feel, Sydney? Okay. You do? You're a little little nervous? A little. That's okay. Don't, don't, don't let your legs go. I know your feet could slip out, but it's okay. Here, let me straighten you back up. You can have a seat. Give her a hand clap. It's literally trusting what God says. It's, it's really believing and not, not over-promising things in this world because here's the deal. God never promised that everything was going to be great here. As a matter of fact, he says this world we live in is is going to be made new one day. He says our bodies are going to be made new one day. This world has been defiled. It It has a sickness, and the sickness is called sin. And God says we live in this world. However, if we'll trust Him with our heart, we'll depend upon Him. He'll help us walk through all of this and experience eternal life exactly how he says we can experience eternal life. We can become great if we become like kids and depend upon God as we walk every step of the way. So what does that mean? That simply means this, I come to God like he's a good father. 
I talk to God. I pray. Not some religious jargon. I pray and I talk to God like he's my heavenly father. I respect him greatly, but I sit on my back porch and I hang out and I talk to God about the things I humanly don't understand. And I ask him for wisdom. I ask him for for provision. I don't always get it right, but I don't expect him to yell at me and scream at me. I, I expect him. I depend upon him and I expect him to get me back on the right path and make it straight and help me walk this life like he intends for me to walk this life. Have you ever watched a little kid? They come unashamedly and they just open up their heart and they want to talk to you. They want to hang out with you. It's amazing to me. Sometimes I can go out in that lobby and I can hang out and, 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 and be out there hanging out. And, and I love, I love to do that and I love to talk. But what I love to do is when someone is talking to me, I recognize there's other kids or other people in the room. And I want to give a person my undivided attention, just like God wants to give you his undivided attention. Yeah. But he wants you to have a heart to understand that he wants to give others an undivided attention too. And so a lot of times God, he, he, he basically teaches us through a lot of different ways. Maybe, maybe he doesn't acknowledge that you're there because he realizes you're impatient and you're selfish and you just want to butt in and take over the conversation. He's like, hey, I'm talking to Mike right now. And I'm, I'm focused on him. Just be patient. Wait a minute. Don't go nowhere. Can I tell you something? Because God's not going to go nowhere. But a lot of times we're like the adult that is like, hey, hey, I, I got to have all the attention. Get out of the way, Mike. Hey, I want to talk to you. Maybe God's teaching you that you know what? Maybe it's a part of his discipline to teach you he cares for you, he cares for the other, but he wants you to, to, to learn and walk with him. Because Jesus said this. You need to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But you need to respect and love others like you love yourself. And so a lot of times the king is teaching us something in the process. And I want to say to you today that God will hang out as long as you need him to hang out. He's not going nowhere. Be patient. Just stand in line and wait. He will come to you. And give you his undivided attention. Yes, he is an everywhere at one time God. He's omnipresent. He is all over the place. But I want you to understand, he sees every need of every child. But sometimes he's teaching you a lesson in the process. Have you ever taught a kid how to depend upon you and your teaching like when they, when they learn to tie their shoes for the first time? Anybody ever? Ever done that? Yeah, it's pretty awesome, isn't it? And listen, this is what is not going to happen. The kid learns how to do it one time. But two weeks later, they forget. As a good parent, you don't get all jacked up and go, I taught you how to, you did it yesterday. I taught you how to do it yesterday. I'm never going to teach you how to do it again. Just trip on your shoestrings and fall. You ain't got it. You'll never get it. God would be patient if you have not learned. And you know what? He will demonstrate again and again and again until you do learn. He's a good teacher. However, he also will not tolerate laziness. And he will let you trip on your shoestring if you know how to tie your shoe, but you're just being irresponsible and you fail to tie your shoe. In other words, if you've been tying your shoe for five years, you know how to tie your shoe. But if you're just going to leave it untied and be irresponsible, God ain't going to bend down and tie your shoe. He's going to be like, well, until you become responsible, then just keep tripping. And see, really, that's, that's our spiritual life a lot of times, isn't it? Is I want you to understand God is highly patient with every human being. The Bible says that God wishes no one would perish, no one would waste away, that all people would be drawn to Him and learn how to do life with the Creator. 
Bible says he is he is slow to anger because he's being patient and wanting people uh, to come to him. But but what happens a lot of times is is we just get calloused and and, and lazy and we don't follow God's ways and we wonder why in the world is our our life is not working. And God's like I taught you that, Ricky, when you were three, and 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 you know that you're gonna trip on your flipping shoe. Ricky, you don't even have, you're 20 years old and you don't even have your shoes tied now. Come on. But, but what's amazing is you are in style. And you did tie your shoes just a different way behind that. You know what? I'm okay with that, Ricky. That's pretty awesome. You know what I'm saying? You did learn how to tie your shoes. Give him a hand clap. It's awesome. You see, God don't want you to trip over your shoestrings, but if you choose to tie them behind your tongues, in front of your tongues, He really don't care. And a lot of times people think, well, shoot, if I don't tie it just the way that, that the first generation tied it or that gen No, 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 no. God is not into, into to just styles and all these methods and all this stuff. No, no, no. God is into purpose. And He don't want you to trip on the shoestrings. If you decide to tie them behind your ankles, He's okay with that. Just don't trip. Let him be patient with you. Let him walk. But you know what? Take responsibility and tie the shoestring. Depend on him. Depend, depend, depend. Provision, provision, provision. That's a humble heart. And that's what God wants us to do is all come to him with a, with a humble heart. Stay humble. Stay humble. Remember he said, anyone who welcomes a little child like this, on my half is welcoming me. He's saying, anyone who becomes as humble as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom. You want to become great, stay humble. Yeah. Remember who you are and remember who God is. One of our greatest enemy is God blesses us and gives us good gifts in life. Is this thing called pride. And pride is simply recognizing that I've got gifts and I've got talents. But beginning to think I'm the only one with gifts and talents in the room and not believing that God blesses others and gives them gifts and talents. And, and I want to encourage you today, God has created a family. It's called the church. And it's for you to participate in. It's for you to use your gifts and talents in. And it's for others to do it too. And as we grow together as God's kids and put faith in Jesus as the resurrected king, the one that came to forgive us of our sin and save us from our sin, push us forward in life. You know what? As we put our faith in him as the Messiah and put our faith in who he says that we are, can I tell you something? Life will begin to be amazing. And I want to close with this today because I want to encourage you I, I know God doesn't want us to be, to be childish in our ways, but he wants us to be childlike in our faith. He just wants us to come to him. And maybe you're, maybe you're callous today. Maybe you're hard today. And, and I want to say to you today what, what Paul said to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He's one of the early church fathers, and he just reminds them of who they have access to, and he reminds them of how great God is. And maybe as we move into Christmas this year, I, I would like to leave you with these words today. I want to encourage you, but I, I want you to remember that God is a provider and God can be depended upon. And the enemy will always strive to make us fear our creator. But the Bible says God doesn't give us bad gifts. He gives us good gifts. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, the Bible says this. Paul says to the church, he says, Every time I think of you, and he says, and I think of you often. May I say that to the church here today? Every time I think of you, and I think of you often, I thank God for your lives of free and open access to God given by Jesus. Yeah. We're going to learn more about that on Christmas Eve, but he says, because Jesus has opened us access to our creator, there's no end to what has happened in you. Now there's no end. It's beyond speech, beyond knowledge. The evidence of Christ has been clearly verified in your lives. 
He goes on to say this. He says, just think. You know what? You don't need a thing. You've got it all. All God's gifts are right in front of you as you wait expectantly for our master Jesus to arrive on the scene for the finality. Do you, do you wait expectantly for Jesus to come by? Because the Bible, the same word that says God will provide for you, says that Jesus resurrected and ascended to heaven and he's coming back for his kids one day. He's coming back for his, for his church one day. Those who, who appropriate and take the faith that they have and put it in him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the Bible says, and not only that, but God himself is right alongside to keep us steady and on track until things are all wrapped up by Jesus. God, who got you started in this spiritual adventure, shares with us the life of his son and our master, Jesus. I want you to pay close attention. The Bible says here, he will never give up on you. Never forget that. In spite of you eating all the Skittles and just not recognizing him as provider, he still doesn't give up on you. In spite of you, depending upon your own ways, your own systems, uh, the, the systems of the land, the Bible says he never gets, gives up on you. He's always pursuing you. He's not mad at you. He didn't come to give you a bag of switches. He didn't come to give you a bag of coal. He came to unwrap the greatest gift known to humanity, and his name is Jesus. He put him in a manger. He allowed him to live a perfect life and really demonstrate the heart of God to the human, to the human race and then allowed him to be put in a grave and resurrect to show us that you know what? If we trust in him, our lives will be resurrected too. And so I invite you today, all of us have faith. We have a measure of faith. But the question is, is what is your faith in? Where have you appropriated your faith? And the Bible says life begins when you appropriate it and put it in Jesus, the Messiah, the liberator, the one that came to not just forgive you, but the one that came to save you and help you become great yeah. in life. But the pathway to greatness is recognizing Him as provider, putting full dependency upon Him, and begin to trust Him with your heart. There's gonna be days that that becomes very difficult, but I do wanna to say to you today, it all begins with putting trust in what God came to do. Yeah. I'd love to give you that opportunity today. I'm not gonna embarrass anyone here today, but maybe God's speaking to your heart. Maybe God brought you here today and put you in that seat because He wants you to know He's a good creator. He's an awesome God. You're going to have some troubles in this world, but you can put your faith in Him. And you know what? I just want to ask that everybody goes ahead and bows their head. Kids, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and bow your head. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, maybe you've always thought of God as being a God that says you better not you better not cry you better not pout because if you do if you're bad you know what I'm never going to be good to you I want you to understand today that God is more concerned with you knowing him in a right relationship than how good or bad you are I want you to understand today that's why I gave the gift of Jesus is so the human race could see the love of God because the moment Jesus allowed himself to be stretched out on that cross by some Roman soldiers, and because of all of our sin in life, is the moment God's great love was displayed in a powerful, powerful way. And Jesus did it just so you could live. The Bible says three days later, he resurrected from a grave. And if we'll put our faith in his resurrection, if we trust him with all of our heart, then then he's going to resurrect our life too. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are on the Christian faith, but maybe God's speaking to your heart today. And, you know, you can, you can think about it. You can mull it over, but I just want to invite you into the family. I want to invite you into the same relationship I found at the age of 32. 
I understood some things about church. I'd gone to church as a, as a kid a little bit. And you know, I've done some wayward things and still do some wayward things. But I'm pretty clear on one thing. is whose kid I am and who provides for me and who I depend upon for everything in life. Because my life isn't dependent upon me, it's dependent upon the one who came and gave his life for me. And if you'd like to step into that family today, just right where you sit, I'm not gonna call you out, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm just gonna allow you in a moment to, to respond by lifting your hand, but, but again, it's not to embarrass you, it's just so I can be encouraged and welcome you to the family, then I'll allow you to put your, your hand down. But just simply where you are today, just say, God, today I wanna trust you. Jesus, I wanna trust, I wanna trust that you died on a cross to show me great love. I wanna trust that you resurrected from a grave to show me that you're gonna resurrect my life. Jesus, I need you to be my liberator. I need you to be my Messiah. I need you to be the one that sets me free to live life. And the moment you say that, can I tell you something? The Bible says that God begins to move in and begins to change you from the inside out. It's a process, but how you become greater in that process is by fully leaning on God, fully dependent upon Him, fully trusting Him. Life's gonna come at you. The enemy's gonna try to make you fear certain things, but God wants to show you love. He wants to show you direction. And He wants you to have hope beyond whatever circumstance you're facing today. And so if you said that prayer and just thank God for His forgiveness, Thank God for life and thank God for his provision that he gave on a cross and the life he gave through the resurrection. The Bible says if we confess that with our mouth and we believe it in the heart, in the core of who we are, in that moment we are, will be, we'll be salvaged. We'll be in a right relationship with God. I trust that some people put their faith in Jesus today and Again, I'm not doing this to embarrass anyone. I'm just doing this to authenticate the moment in your heart today. But if you said that prayer today, I'd just love for you to put your hand in the air when I count to three and I'll pray a prayer of blessing over you. Then I'll tell you about a gift we have for you. And then in a moment, we'll have an opportunity to give financially together. But you know, I just wanna welcome you to the family today. So if you said that prayer today and you trusted Jesus for the first time, and I count to three, just stick your hand in the air. One, two, three, wherever you are in this room today. Praise God, ma'am. Praise God, sir. Praise God. Praise God. You, you can simply slip your hand down. God, you see these hands today. These are your children. They belong to your family. We thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church. And God, those who put their faith, their trust, their belief in the Jesus of the Bible today, we wanna welcome them to the family. And God, I pray you'd bless their life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Can you give them a hand clap today?